The next presentation will be in English. Can immersive technologies create greater curiosity and learning experiences for children? This is a case study demonstration by Daniel Lester of how immersive technologies can create greater curiosity and learning experiences. Daniel is a business developer and sales manager at Interspectral, a 3D visual visualization company from Norrköping. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Can I get a nod of the heads if that, that looks good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, as explained, my name is Daniel Lester and I'm here to discuss the all important topic of can immersive technologies create greater curiosity and learning experience for children? Now, I hope uh, everyone in this group agrees with me that the answer to this is quite simple. It's a yes, <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to go through today uh, a little bit about how we've come to uh, that, ex to that uh, answer. And to do that, I need to take you a little bit through what it is we do as a company uh, to build up a bit of the backstory. Uh, so we are a 3D visualization company. We're based out of here in North Shipping and I work there, work at Interspectral as a uh, business developer. And I'm sure everyone in the room has uh, seen one of these before. This is an Egyptian mummy, 2,400 years old. Uh, but most of you have probably seen one in a museum behind a glass case with some sort of writing on the side. Uh, and that was probably the most you got to interact with this, with this uh, artifact. These artifacts like these in most cases are, are CT scanned or MRI scanned for science and research purposes. And that's where we come into the, into the play. We, we help turn those CT scans, not into science and just into science and research, but turn it into a science communication tool. And as I go here to my next slide, we can, hopefully you can see here, I understand uh, Zoom is a, cuts down the frame rate, but I, hopefully you can see a little bit how the video is interacting. Uh, and this here is actually, it's not the mummy we were just looking at, because uh, that mummy is in Sweden. This one's actually in Sydney, Australia, you know, in a museum there. And it's a, it's a child mummy. And so, as you can see here, what we have done is we have taken the CT scans, uh, we have put them into one 3D volumetric uh, data set. We have then segmented this data set so that you can have different layers. We can have a look here at the outer, the outer layer. We can have a look at the body. We can have a look at the skeleton, the X-ray, and we can segment out to certain little key elements as well. Uh, and then we put this into, we also then colorize it in finishing up the content development. Once we've done that, we then put it into this software that allows the user to interact with it in an interactive way, uh, an intuitive way. So the idea is no one has to stand beside the, beside the exhibit and help people interact. And you can see here on the right beside me, this is, uh, you've got two children here actually interacting with our software. And the way our software is used today is uh, it's predominantly used on a giant touch screen, uh, a large touch table, 64 inch, uh, which you can see there. Uh, and this is this keeps it very much in the two D the two D realm. <clears throat> so our technology came about ten years ago, and when we first introduced it, this was the result. Uh, you could see people were queuing up down the street to get into the museum to look to look at this Egyptian mummy in this case. So over the last ten years, many things has happened. Uh, one, we've got to work with some of the most incredible customers on some of the most amazing projects. Uh, and in doing so, we've developed an incredible uh, 3D library uh, that is currently used by us. Then we want to make that more obtainable to the world. To give you an understanding of the library, I can take us through a few different cases. Here, we have a dinosaur. <laughs> we did not scan a dinosaur. That would not be possible. We scanned the bones of a dinosaur. And this is from the Queensland Museum in Brisbane, Australia. And we scan that dinosaur and we help the paleontologists tell the story of how they get a bone and turn it into this dinosaur that, uh, that engulfs our imagination today. Here is a, uh, this is a mummified uh, eagle from Ripley's Believe It or Not collection. Here's a mummy from Sydney that we just talked about, a, a baby, a child mummy. Uh, here you have a mummy that we worked with the British Museum, Gabrielle Amand. It's a, um, it's a naturally mummified mummy, mummified in the sand. We have here a sword from the uh, Cultural History Museum in Oslo, a Viking sword that is. This here is a healthy human body anatomy. Uh, this is a meteorite from Mars. 
that's in the Field Museum in Chicago. This is, this is a uh, stingray from the Georgia Aquarium. This one everyone's probably familiar with, the COVID virus. So we've got a scan of that particle along with a patient that actually experienced COVID-19. Here is a frog and here is a banana and a kiwi from the Kew Gardens in London. And <clears throat> the reason I'm showing this to you is to give you guys an understanding of the amazing educational experiences that we have built up over the year. There's so many great data sets. And I'd go as far as saying is we might be fortunate enough to have uh, the world's largest data set of 3D volumetric data that is visualized in this to this high quality. So obviously with uh, with this happening, we've 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 got this we've got this great tool. We've been collecting this great data. And for us, the next step is how can we take our product to the next level? And to do that, we, we have to have a look. How are people interacting with that? And we are very interested in science communication. That's where we kind of see ourselves going in the future. So we, uh, we started to study the attendees or the visitors interacting with our software from a, uh, from a, mostly from the child's perspective. How were they interacting with that? And these were the two findings that we came about. And I, in no way do I think these two findings are revolutionary, but they were very important for us in terms of us developing where we were gonna go with our product. <clears throat> So the first one that we came away with was that children greater, gain a greater learning experience when given the chance to explore from themselves. I, I think we could all pretty much agree on that. If you put a child in front of a TV screen, they're going to learn something. If you put them in front of a screen where they get have to explore themselves, it becomes a completely different learning experience. And that's something that we wanted to continue to capitalize on. <clears throat> These data sets, as you're looking at them today, those are videos. They're good learning experiences. You're probably sitting there looking at this megalomania, I can't say that word, and you're probably sitting there learning something, but you're not really sure what you're learning. Whereas if you have the data set in front of you, you have the ability to peel away the layers yourself and go in and look at the right information points, it becomes a much better learning experience. The second big point that we took away from our observations was the wow factor. We came pretty quickly to learn that the wow factor creates an imprint in the brain of this memory, of this learning experience. And that's something we're very fortunate. We still see that happening today with our technology. Quite often visitors are coming up to this, they, they see this, they look at it. And once they grasp the comprehension that what they are looking at is the real thing, it's not just a mesh, it's not just a, something someone's created in the lab that created on a computer. This is actually the real, the real uh, human body or fish that they're looking at. Uh, it creates quite a wow factor. But we wanted to take these two things, mold them together and continue to develop our product. And so that led, left us with the, the following uh, ambition, I would say. Uh, the aim to within the science communi communication sector to make volumetric data have a wow factor while also being more attainable. And I think the wow factor speaks for itself, but the more attainable part is the part that we are also very interested in. To, to access data like this today, um, it's not easy. You have to have a standard computer dedicated to it. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second, actually. Um, I probably should also mention, you probably noticed I've got lots of videos running here on the side. I hope that they're somewhat entertaining. I don't know how many of you guys noticed, but I never knew a turtle's spine bent at 90 degrees. Uh, in quite fascinating stuff. So once we performed all of this observation research and took it back home and started to think about how can we take our product forward, how can we get ourselves into the immersive space, um, we came away with two products that we are currently working on today. And they, they work very closely together. They, in fact, they work off each other. Um, the first one is streaming. And this is where we come into the attainable section. So you can see here on the on the right, that is a human, a healthy human body we're looking at. Uh, the anatomy, the nervous system, uh, the muscular system and whatnot. So to take this scan, you actually end up with, you take the CT scan, you end up with taking 1,800 one centimeter slice images of that body. And then we pile that together in our, in our system. We then colorize it, segment it, da da da. And what you end up with is 30 gigabytes worth of data. That's a lot of data. And that's a very large amount of data to be working with in 
life in real time. And <clears throat> to do that the way it is today means that you have to have a dedicated CPU and GPU, basically a dedicated computer running the software. Uh, and that's just not feasible for a lot of our customers, especially in the education sector. Uh, they can't be investing into the software along with some heavy, heavy hardware. So we started uh, coming up with this concept of a streaming solution. And it has been a challenge, to say the least, in becoming absolute, a streaming solution. But we've come a very long way uh, to the fact that we have three beta customers working with the streaming solution today. And we hope to have a have uh, it rolling out at the start of next year. Uh, this is really important to our immersive technologies because the other R&D project we are working on is AR. Uh, and this is where we want to get into that immersive space. As I forgot to turn the sound off there. Um, and, but the thing is, again, if we want to go into the immersive space, we don't want our, our, our people to be investing in large computing in order to run the HoloLens. So we have to we have to solve the solution the streaming solution first before we can get into the AR market. However, we do have an industrial partner that is extremely interested in the AR market, and you can see here on the left we've already started to uh, interact with that technology. Uh, this is a this is a very beta project here at the moment, um, and when we get to this stage, it's going to be a really exciting time for us because we're we're not, at the moment, all things within the AR space are all based on meshes. They're cones, they're, 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 there's no actual substance to what you're looking at. You can't peer inside the things you're looking at, they're just meshes. But if we can get our data into that space, you're gonna actually have real 3D volumetric data. Uh, so you can imagine with that human body, you could have the student opening up the human body, peering through it, taking out a certain piece they think is interesting, putting it over here, and then just observing that, spinning it around, interacting with it. So it's, um, this is the direction we're going. We've noticed that it is extremely exciting. We think it's very fun. Uh, and I have a little demonstration here, not of, I have to be clear, this is not a company we're affiliated with. We have no relationship, to, but we found this video online uh, and it's of mesh data. And it's kind of, a, it's, it shows very clearly the direction of where we want to go uh, with this uh, with this information. So I'll just see if I can share that. I think I might be locked to the PowerPoint. Stop sharing. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see this video here of a cat. Yep. So this is uh, something we, we found from Road VR. Leap motion. So that is a uh, that is we would like to do that. That is what we're heading towards, but with volumetric data, which uh, has its own its own uniqueness in itself. But uh, that's uh, that is all for me on on this topic today. So if anyone has any uh, questions, would love to answer them. I see a bit scary that the, the chat. <laughs> uh, are the CT scans and the resulting tessellated interactive experiences based on real scans on real human subjects? Yes, correct. Yes. Yes. So those are those are real CT scans. So we have CT scans of uh, uh, only one of one healthy human human because, as many people probably know, the radiation in a CT scan is not good. You don't want to uh, you don't want to be 
doing that too many times in your life. So we have one healthy human being, but we actually have a lot of scans of people that are unfortunately not healthy. Uh, and those are much better learning experiences. Uh, we have one of a road accident that is very popular with the kids trying to figure out what is the cause of death in that, in that uh, autopsy. And some follow up here. Um, are they then one to one reproductions of the? Uh, exactly. Yes, yes. They are. And if so, have you dealt with consent? <laughs> yes, very yes. much so. <laughs> yes, it's a very ongoing topic for us, uh, especially within the human anatomy perspective. And uh, of course, working with uh, human remains as well. It's a, a lot of discussion around that. Uh, I have a question also. Uh, mm -hmm. Can uh, immersive technology be also be a helpful tool for, for children with learning dif difficulties? Uh, yep. Have you looked into that uh, subject? Uh, I mean, no, not, not in such detail, but uh, it definitely, I, I can say off the top of my head, absolutely. I definitely feel like it will be. Uh, yep. um, it's just, it creates a new way of learning, a different way of interacting. Mm. Um, the, the, I have a question. Mm. The, the objects that you have shown us are, and also in connection to museums, are quite um, spectacular, like dinosaur skeletons and human mm. bodies, etc. For uh, museums that don't have these spectacular objects, could, could you see a, a use for this technology for other mm. museums and other objects? Absolutely. So uh, one thing we're working towards is trying to build up this database so that museums can share, this, share content with each other. Uh, so we actually have a, a royalty license situation in place. Uh, so for example, the dinosaurs from Queensland Museum, they've been purchased by museums in America that have similar exhibits with similar dinosaurs and they show off the same thing uh, because their CT scanning and research is not at the level that the Queensland Museum is at. Uh, and the next step for us is we have it interacting and sharing within the museum and science sector uh, industry, but then we want to take it to the next step of sharing it with the schools as well, uh, once this technology becomes a little more prominent within schools. I think we're we are talking after Organ Ellen. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can see that Frederick wants to talk about consent. Okay, if you can elaborate further on the consent. Yeah, I, I would be happy to talk with Frederick in person. Uh, yeah. about that because it is it's quite a, a lengthy discussion and <laughs> we have uh, a lot of can imagine. legal lawyers and whatnot getting involved so i'd be happy to have that with him offline um this technology how because museums as museums we would like to reach out beyond our physical buildings do you mm -hmm. see people our audiences taking part of these experiences from home in a foreseeable future Absolutely, yeah. especially with these virtual museums popping up, uh, like our technology can quite easily be slotted into behind a, uh, a paywall or behind like some sort of wall in there. So if you go into your virtual museum and then you go to look at the, the mummy and then you can click in and go even further and interact with the mummy in there. Yeah, that it's definitely something we foresee our technology playing a part with. We, we definitely hope so, at least. <laughs> Interesting, great. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. perfect. More questions? Uh, I think there are a one. Linköping Slott och Domkyrke Museum have an excellent transition over time done by Interspectral. That, that, that's a, a case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it was. That was a, we finished that project, I believe, last year, where we, we showed the uh, castle being um, over time how it has progressed. So how it went from just a little hut to the, the magnificent castle it is today. And that was a really fun project because we found some hidden things in, in that experience, uh, which I, I won't just tell anyone about. I'll just say, if you go to Link Shopping Slot and check it out, it's a really cool case study. <laughs>